This afternoon, um, we're excited <coughs> to hear a lecture by Dr. Christina Bucher. Um, and uh, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Bucher. Um, she teaches theology here at Duquesne and teaches philosophy at CCAC. Um, she earned her PhD in philosophy from Marquette in 2009 with a dissertation on Ricoeur. Um, Ricoeur, I think it's safe to say, is the center of her academic work, but um, she's also um, brought Ricoeur into conversation um, with a lot of interesting people like Martha Nussbaum and Levinas. Um, and, um, and so um, she's currently working on a book project um, that will incorporate um, material from her, from her paper today. Um, and uh, her paper today um, is called From Ipsaity to Kenosis, Reflections on Ricoeur's Itinerary to the face-to-face, -face. Um, and I think the, the normal um, um, MO for these philosophy talks is that Dr. Bucher will give her lecture, um, maybe we'll take a five minute break to stretch our legs, then we'll have a Q&A conversation, and then we'll have um, a wine, cheese, and chocolate reception out in, the, out in the ante room. And so thanks for being here today, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bucher. project with uh, all of you. Um, so as you, as you know, uh, the, um, this paper is on uh, kenosis and uh, uh, ipsaity, more specifically renouncement of uh, ipsaity. And um, um, most references are actually in uh, um, the paper um, for today, most of are to his uh, work uh, leading up to death, vivant jusqu'à la mort. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to start. Um, Ricoeur speaks um, frequently of Ipse, uh, gratuitously self-giving and free subject, capable of initiative and of ethical relationships. Ipse is the decider in principle of his own now. It is Ipse is the subject of ethics. In oneself as another, he relates Ipse to Ida, which is character. The latter would not have any force if it were not meant over and against the force of Ipse. The Ipse idem dialectics refers to the interdependence, this interdependence at the heart of living. Subject of morality, idem refers to the unfolding of the history of moral habits. But again, such unfolding would not be possible, according to Ricoeur, without the explosiveness of freedom, which as the self in the present, in the now, creates as if absolutely one's life project. We can therefore say that without the ipse idem relation, there is no relation between ethics and morality. And we can uh, recognize here the indebtedness of Ricoeur uh, to Levinas. So far, so good. But there is no doubt um, about the centrality of ipse in Ricoeur's work. And yet, in Vivant jusqu'à la mort, uh, Ricoeur writes also of a renouncement to ipse in view of a preparation to death. Un renoncement à l'ipsé pour une préparation à la mort. Suffering, especially dying, questions subjectivity itself, that is to say anything we articulate about it, from the subject aspiration to being to its fragility of existence. Uh, this assertion of renouncement to ipséity offers quite a surprise, I believe, for readers habituated to the recurrent ipséidem distinction, and is a noteworthy turning point that brings Ricoeur closer to Levinas, closer, in fact, than Ricoeur had ever uh, envisaged it. So I will dwell on this surprise, on this turn. What sort of turn is this from Ipse to its renouncement? What or who enables the turn? What, whom does the turn enable? And does it mark the annihilation of hermeneutics, the forgetfulness of all past, a renewal of some sort of the self? And can this turn make any sense independently of, of or the other works? How do we see Ricoeur perform the turn to Levinas? And it is with these questions in mind that I actually um, um, uh, thought about uh, the following uh, reflection. The um, first set of meditations are on um, precisely Ricoeur's turn to Levinas. In dying, Ipse may choose, Ricoeur writes, self-sacrifice. This renouncement does not undo the love one offers even at the end. 
But if the very lips they sacrifice, they sacrifice, who loves them? Who is the who of love? And who is it that asks the question? This paradox may, I hope, catch our attention and prompt us to renew our interrogations regarding the ethical life. Insofar as we reflect about persons in ontological terms, whether we refer to Aristotle's ontology or to um, um, Heideggerian ontology, or in terms of capabilities, whether we refer to the phenomenological insights of Merleau Ponty or to Nussbaum's understanding of capabilities. So insofar as we reflect on persons in ontological terms, we articulate, describe, delimit a sphere of knowledge where we aim at learning, sharing that learning, doing, hence changing situations on the basis of this learning. But faced with dying and death, something newly ambiguous dawns on us, not changing things or doing new things, not initiating or acquiring, but struggling with everything we called meaning on meaningful action. So there is no eureka here, and perhaps here lies the deconstruction of the I am and the I can, a deconstruction that is, to speak with Derrida, the gift of death, Don Elano. Bereft of the I am and the I can, we enter the order of the I cannot, and this is kenosis, self-emptying. We contemplate ourselves dying in living otherwise than in the I am or the I can mode, namely in living in a kenotic mode. The order of kenosis reveals then the passivity of the subject and as such converts or transfigures the relation to the other. In the I am and the I can, the orders of initiative, one, can, uh, one um, cannot fully attest to being the ear that listens to the voice of the other. One cannot be content with listening to the voice sealed in the gaze of the other's face. One also responds, articulates, initiates. The surprising thing then that I discovered in unwrapping Vivant du Scalamont is he keeps turning toward Levinas on the issue of passivity of self and the priority of the other. In most works in which he discussed Levinas previously, with the exception right, of these fragments, uh, Ricoeur explicitly criticized Levinas, uh, Levinas's being for the other on account of deprioritizing the self, of holding Ipse, as it were, hostage to the other. This critique occurs not only in some of his ethical and hermeneutical masterpieces, oneself as another course of recognition, but also in his works on psychoanalysis, the earlier one, where he placed Levinas' philosophy of being for the other on a par with um, idealization, so transference or working through not yet assumed to, to, assume to the end of the analysis. On the contrary, in Vivant Giscardamont, he's getting a Levinas' constant revelation of the ethical exigency absolute exigency. He implicitly takes all criticism back as he himself understands that kenosis is something else than ipseity, a greater exigency and difficulty than ipseity. To put it otherwise, Ricoeur understands that Levinas' ethical work has never been on anything else but kenosis um, than the difficult freedom of a kenotic ethics preceding morality, not only in relation to morality, because this dialect, as we have seen, was at the center of his work in the previous works. Um, now I have a few uh, reflections on um, uh, kenosis as uh, love. In uh, uh, Living After Death, uh, he just speaks further, further still of, of love, of love as immemorial call, as surplus of meaning of an amour oblige that pervades all human experience and radically oblige before death taken literally and directly, or in the absence of any hermeneutical detour, amour oblige could be unfortunately read as some kind of moralism, right? We hear oblige, obligation, and a uh, thing that here is doing here is, uh, you know, some type of uh, mor uh, moral analysis. But once the hermeneutical detour is considered, educated away from passive misreadings, one notices the poetic oblige of um, affectivity. The affectivity that comes with the responsibility of love may be said to be experienced like an obligation, as if to love is its own discipline, as if it is its own ascesis. So even feeling here is said in the mode of the as if. In love it is as if we feel obliged. How? To whom? Why? No longer can the language of love be taken for granted. Once the love question has been truthfully rather than rhetorically recognized, the way we get to the meaning is central to the understanding of meaning and central to living that meaning. 
What does like or as if mean here as hermeneutical mediation between love and obligation? First and foremost, I believe we are signaled into the canonic order of love. Love, I would specify as a surplus of excess, not excess of meaning, but an excess to meaning, is lived out not in the I am or the I can, but in the I cannot. Just like death and dying, love and loving show us to ourselves and to each other in ways that ontology and even the phenomenology of the I, of the I can uh, cannot show. What is absent from the ontological grasp lives, is real, but cannot be faced except in a renouncement of that grasp. We are equally emptied of conditioned meanings, I would say projections, of, uh, and conditioned practices in meaning love and in living the meaning of love. We arrive at the <coughs> unconditional. The unconditional of loving is in turn, though, unconditionally threatened. And I'm going to talk about this unconditional threat that is the match to love, namely death. Death as kenosis. Love's match in terms of unconditionality, ineffability is paradoxically death. Death joins love in giving meaning to our encounter with the unconditional, our experience of humility. Being stripped of, empty of conditioned meanings and practices means, means also being stripped of habits. Death and dying interrupt theodicies, ontologies, ethical apodicticity, and hermeneutics of self-reliance. To sum up, death and dying displace the subject from the order of the I am and the I can to the order of the I cannot, making visible a horizon of meaning somehow neither contradictory nor useless. I could argue, well, how is that important uh, you know, in our daily life or in academia, all these reflections on uh, the I cannot. But it is neither a contradictory nor useless um, uh, reflection. Yet how are death and dying not an end to philosophy, to life, to hope? How are death and dying not an end to the fasa fas, the end of the other? I talked about self-emptying, where is the other? Why is kenosis giving oneself for the other? How is it a, an intersubjectivity? The self empties itself of all certainty, all determined anticipation, all unconcealment. It empties even, with your right, stoic courage before death. Not that this is not important, but it empties even of that. The whole life, if that is what self means, the whole life is questioned through death. And why would stoic courage be of value since uh, the I does not know itself, not faced with uh, death? Even the meaning of otherness that one thought, one genuinely understood, is emptied in limit experiences. This kenosis is such that before any other is men meant as other, the self, it's the self that sees before that its own absence, darkness, secret, otherness, all these absence, darkness, being um, names of what cannot be known from the name alone. It's an experience that we are, as he is trying to, um, uh, to articulate as, uh, as he can. It's no longer the type of articulation that we, um, you know, that is <coughs> constructive, or rather deconstructive. So the name is not a premise. It is not used here, the darkness, sacred uh, um, um, absence. is not used as matter of inference. Does not welcome the therefore. It is the trace of the un unobjectifiable face. I can see the otherness of the other, in other words, retroactive, I think the argument is, attest to the infinite absence of an object because I too am another to myself. The abyss is not just before, before me, the other whose face uh, I face, but within me. If I took myself for granted, how could I cherish the other in his, her otherness? Face to face, then, means for Ricoeur, from abyss to abyss. And this in no way marks a symmetry, I think, nor is this some subtle form of asymmetrical relation, because again, we are not constructing anything. On the contrary, it's the suspension of all symmetry or asymmetry. Um, in any face-to-face, -face, there is always already an icon of hospitality. And this applies well to death and dying. The face-to-face -face with our own mortality is lived as welcoming of life's end, welcoming the I cannot. <coughs> Uh, that's another, that's an, it seems something, uh, uh, something new. Um, we are not talking about uh, being empty, we are talking about welcoming, about hospitality. Although the end is naturally inevitable, welcoming it is on the contrary an act of sacrifice of one's pain, a sacrificial goodness. 
The otherness in us that cannot be taken away from us, that cannot mean other than us, is nonetheless otherness. If I acknowledge the abyss of selfhood when confronted with my own dying, then what will be the who in dying? Does this who persevere beyond death? What and who are left behind? The key to go, I believe, further, or deeper or higher, whatever the metaphor is here, like Laco could talk about this, um, is not a new method, a new word, a new category. The key is living one's own dying as a gift giving. Again, back to Derrida, Donne la mort. Uh, the following reflections are reflections prompted by um, the hymn of the Song of Songs and Ricoeur's reflection on the Song of Songs. And um, as the song um, hymn did, love is as strong as death, jealousy is unrelenting as the grave. Ricoeur pondered uh, the who of the Song of Songs in his essay, Nuptial Metaphor. Uh, according to his well-known hermeneutics of mimesis, he signaled to us to enter, hermeneutically prepared, the garden that transforms the self who dares inhabit the world of that weird text. But in his posthumously published reflections on death, Ricoeur sketches another side to his understanding of love and death as equally strong, expressed for us unyieldingly. Love and death equally beyond being, equally exigent in their attraction, are absolutely other. The mystery of life, the otherness of life, or its apophatic logos is love and death. So being for the other is living prepared to love and prepared to die. But what is strong as death? And of course the question in the Song of Songs is poetic. Is life stronger than death? Is who the I, Ipse, so strong that no end can overtake it? So strong that no who vanishes? Or did the Song of Songs inspire a poetical hermeneutics of intersubjectivity. The ambiguous reply to what is strong as death was recognized by Hikyot as both inspiring and ambiguous. It is not life, rather love, that is stronger than death. But would not love and life imply each other? Isn't there a correlation between them? Why thinking of love and death instead? Why does Hikyot see welcoming the end for the secret as the I? as love rather than life. And where is being, being what being, being very ontology uh, at this point? For uh, um, these questions are actually questions of self-discipline. So the more we are trying to understand, um, uh, the more we see ourselves um, um, living ascetically, actually. Um, these questions are questions of, uh, as Foucault wrote, epimelea how to, self-care. Self-examination is not divorced from self-care. and. Uh, Jean Grondin has written a wonderful article on this all. Um, my own life is a contradiction, but this only makes sense in the moment of a dying to oneself moment. This is the place from which my life can be for the other, abyss, kenosis. That is why the face-to-face -face does not show us to ourselves, it's not a mirror. This is why there is always more talk about the face-to-face -face than actually face-to-face, -face, unfortunately. Who wants to be for the other, sacrificing self-respect, self-esteem, all concerned really with my needs, my demands for support from others, support to be recognized, support to be valued. But this final, I guess, epoche, this um, suspend yourself, is not just a methodological device in uh, living up to death. It's not just an as if of ephemeral hermeneutical ascesis. This epoche of me and my so-called own being this epoche of the I am and the I can is the very qualification of my movement to the other. Kenosis allows for the face-to-face, -face, and it's not a mere hermeneutics, it's not the beginning of ethics, it is its ascetic condition. It is the beginning of ethics, it's ascetic condition. So Ricoeur, I, we can recognize James Levinas in attesting here to um, the difficulty, exigency, lifetime exercise for facing truly the other as another. It is actually in his meditation, these meditations on death, that Ricoeur is for the first time, in, I believe, not hesitant about his indebtedness to and his agreement with Levinas, but fully cohimning the ascetic veil of love, the um, dying of love. Um, the following meditations are actually on the language in which he speaks about uh, the dying of love. And the language is peculiarly um, 
uh, taken from psychoanalysis. Uh, he speaks of transfer of love unto others, actually transfer is transference. Um, Ricoeur understands kenosis as the place for the face-to-face, -face, the self-emptying that grounds ethics. But this place is home to love, to tr so-called transfer of love unto others. The language is, of course, highly suggestive. Uh, transfer in French is not just transfer, the transmission, but transference. And projecting a love ideal onto another is called amour de transfert. So what we are witnessing here is uh, the reverse of the movement from um, amour de transfert to transfer, uh, tra transfer de l'amour, from a projection to self-emptying. Rigueur reverses then the hermeneutical movement from projected love to authentic or unconditional, relational love, and speak, speaks hence um, uh, intentionally of transfer de l'amour. In ethics, in the face-to-face, -face, we actually pass from projection to face-to-face. Um, um, -face. My concern is um, now the following. Why is Ricoeur keeping the language of transference if he pursues the overcoming of egocentrism, of projections and um, objectifications of the other, bad faith and misinterpretations? Why are you hanging on to that language? Or is it just a more or less vain wordplay, right? Do we just switch <laughs> the order and it's so nice. Um, wouldn't Levinas' language of face-to-face -face be enough here? Wouldn't kenosis be enough? So don't we have already an ethical and theological language. Why suddenly borrowing, and what sort of borrowing is that from psychoanalysis? In Ricoeur's earlier works on psychoanalysis, the negative, he says, and non-ethical, he says, significance given to the traditional mode of transference um, um, is clear. I'm going to quote from uh, his uh, um, uh, article, Psychiatry and Moral Values, <coughs> published initially in um, American Handbook of Psychiatry. Quote, the fundamentally non-ethical character of psychoanalysis results not only from its theoretical status or even from its discoveries concerning morality, <coughs> but also from its technique in that it is therapeutic. This therapy implies, in principle, the neutralization of the moral point of view." End quote. And uh, another quote from the same article, "...veracity is the sole ethical value implied by its analytic technique." It's clear that um, transference of love, transfer de l'amour, would have no place and would make no sense in Ricoeur's um, psychoanalytic hermeneutics. The only psychoanalytical hermeneutics unfolding during the 70s, when this article was published, is that of veracity. Because ethics was, however, at the very center of Ricoeur's hermeneutics as the Socratic concern for self-examination as self-care, Ricoeur searched for a bridge from the ethics of veracity to one of goodness and love. He thought he found a way to overcome the non-ethical theoretical and therapeutical analysis with Heinz Kohut's self-psychology. Now let us read about what exactly fascinated the people about Kohut in the 80s. So I'm going to quote from um, Self in Psychoanalysis and uh, in Phenomenological Philosophy, an article uh, published in uh, 86 in Psychoanalytic Inquiry. Quote, to the militant ethics of veracity, which entails an attitude of confrontation between the analyst and the analysant's resistances, Self-psychology opposes the ethics underlying empathy, which may be summed by one word that comes frequently from Kohut's pen, attunement or consonance. In this regard, if Freud is the heir of enlightenment, where the accent was on conflict between the power of knowledge and the resistance of darkness, I would see an unstated filiation between Kohut and these British moral philosophers who have seen the fundamental human bond in pity, compassion, and sympathy. For my own part, I was quite moved by Kohut's repeated affirmation that human beings need the support of self-objects capable of helping them realize their project of an integrated creativity up to their last breath, that is, up to the point of becoming moribund." End quote. So ten years later, in the 80s, we see Ricoeur maintaining his attitude about the bond between analyst and analysant, one of confrontation, one revolving around conflict, an inner conflict, of interpretation, but we also see him looking for a psychology that centers its therapeutic and theoretical experience on the one hand and its philosophical, anthropological, 
Assumptions, on the other hand, on pity, compassion, sympathy. This is the only reason he prefers Cahoot to Freud, a preference based, we must recall, on a certain interpretation at that time of Freudianism, an earlier one. But what happens 10 years later in the 90s? Uh, in the late 90s, when these fragments are written on kenosis and trans uh, transcellular transference of love, we witness, I believe, um, an important change, another turn and another surprise. If with kenosis, he returns to Levinas in gracious agreement, with transference, he returns to Freud with a renewed apologetic hermeneutics of transference and analysis. More importantly, he returns with a poetic hermeneutics of analysis. How is this return to Freud meaningful to us? Let us take a look of the, uh, at the language of transference used in Living Up to Death. I'm just going to quote. Um, um, so we have seen he uses uh, transference unto the other of love of life, transfer sur l'autre de l'amour de la vie, um, as a way to understand renouncement to our own survival. Renouncement à la survie propre, our own, as it were. Then he speaks of liberation pour l'essentiel, liberation for the essential revelation, which is the face-to-face. -face. So, uh, um, transference as liberation, as self-renouncement. Another word is le report sur, le, sur autrui. So one sort of um, goes back, moves, in, um, moves itself onto the other. Um, and finally, he speaks of uh, 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 the meaning of verification, attestation, um, of, uh, of a detachment, which is transference. So, le transfert vérifie, atteste, met à l'épreuve, ou éprouve, le détachement dans sa dimension de générosité. Uh, de générosité. So, it's, it, it is the meaning itself of kenosis. Uh, in um, in, the, in uh, the sketches, we see um, that the, if you want, the um, opposite of transference here is, and he repeats, uh, this quite a few times, uh, imaginary projection. So what is transference in the, an ethical sense is the opposite of projection, imaginaire. It says it again and again and again. Um, L'imaginaire de la survie. Um, he, um, he speaks of transmission unto the other of a certain, of a certain uh, attitude and of a certain um, service. La transmission à l'autre de son obéissance dans le service. And um, he calls transfer, uh, transfer, uh, this ethical understanding of transference, l'éthique positive du détachement. This is the positive ethics of self-detachment. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the final word that he um, uses and, uh, as in interchangeable with transference is service for the other. Service pour l'autre. At a certain point, <laughs> He gets to be even a briefer and simply aimer l'autre, loving the other. Um, and I think um, all these, you know, uh, all this accent that is intentional, that is uh, so meaningful, on the psychological uh, language, all this is to make us understand uh, um, transfers at an ethical level, not moral, not political, not emotive, merely at an ethical level, the chaotic one. And as such, transference, he argues, is not an end or a content of a life, the what of a life, but a vocational movement, a movement. In taking as hermeneutical points of reference, kenosis and transference, Ricchio's concern with dying yields, I think, a difference between anguish about death, the anguish of the one reflecting on the death of another, and anguish about the death of the one who is dying. What Rikyo sees is that a transfiguration occurs at the heart of reflection when an ethical transfiguration takes place. And he writes at a certain point uh, about um, the help that love represents. He says, um, uh, French, uh, l'amitié aide uh, l'agonisant et la compréhension même. Friendship helps the moribund, but also comprehension. The anguish that I have about the uh, death before the dying of a close other may be transfigured into joy when I do not assist or objectify or imagine a loss or imagine a diminishing of the other. Indeed, death does not take away either the ethical recognition 
or the dignifying compassionate word and presence. In ethical apperception, face to face, that is co suffering, anguish is transfigured into fraternity. Death is not undone. Uh, recall, um, the grave is unyielding, as the song of songs um, uh, says it. But death becomes irrelevant. The irrelevant fact to the lived experience of love, sociality, fraternity, interchangeable words. These words are fundamentally interchangeable as the words essential, fundamental, um, religious, which point to the revelation of the other as the beloved. In living up to death, um, the essential, the fundamental, the religious, l'essentiel, le fondamental, le religieux, actually signify what is essential about dying. The religious fundamental situation of humanity before the dying of any other is fraternity as a practice, hermeneutics, um, and spirituality. As one experiences the transfiguration of anguish into fraternity, one experiences a transfiguration from fear into hope, from fear of offending into the impertinence of fraternity that does not believe in the death of another, but in the other, despite that. It is not that one becomes idiotically indifferent to neurobiological recognition of the fact of death, rather indifferent to the indifference that such recognition cannot challenge or transfigure. And it's so very clear now how in depth he becomes during, uh, at this time to Levinas. Not just to his ideas, but to his language, indifference and non-indifference. The hermeneutics that transfigures reflection and lifestyle from indifference to the ethical face-to-face -face is poetic. Ricoeur speaks of the ethical poesis, the gracious life of the gaze, regard, which is not, he says, an external uh, um, uh, gaze. Um, not regard du dehors sur moi, le mot vivant. He says that of this external gaze, I want to liberate myself uh, from that regard, c'est de ce regard du dehors sur le mot vivant que je veux me délivrer. Poetic sensibility, creative thinking, and re remember that the first Poetry, according to him, is the, uh, that of the commandment of love. Our poetic imperative par excellence. That is uh, exacerbated, this poetic sensibility, exacerbated by the ethical face-to-face. -face. And that's what moves human to non-indifference to the dead, to the dying, to the otherness of any who. That reflection is just one that enables one, empowers one to say to the dying living, to say to the anonymous other, brother, sister, child, my joy, to say to death, irrelevant, stink, to say to the end, beginning. This face-to-face, -face, this loving and uh, poetic regard, poetic gaze, does not indiscriminate, does not see all at once, but, um, all others as dying, um, he, um, doesn't see, he calls the essential indistinction, la distinction essentielle. It is here that phenomenological ethics and hermeneutics of ambiguity challenge the question of identity, deepening the question's values um, to degrees that humanities are called to handle. They are still called to handle the crazy ideas, as Levinas would say. On the other hand, the anguish of dying, as one lives it in first person singular, may also be transfigured, challenged um, let's use Rikyo's term, essentially, fundamentally, religiously. He speaks of, uh, of, of, of grace in dying, la grâce, uh, grâce d'un certain mourir. When evil opposes itself to fraternity, does not tempt the self, does not tempt it into seeing, uh, into self-gaze that only sees the soon to be nothing, a self-look that cancels the horizon under which one is still among brothers and sisters, and more strongly still for the other. At every single second, a talk about fraternity and grace may be the most offensive, insulting to the dying, the ones thinking of them, of the dead ones, the greatest temptation. There is in no way um, that he works um, uh, through this imaginary of the face to face um, in order to solicit the reader to look, to prepare himself for this type of gaze, which is not uh, external, uh, but uh, uh, the gaze of, of love. How can one write of the commemoration of the dead, of the dying, of one's death? Um, that's one, uh, an, another question that he um, uh, relates to kenosis. Uh, how can one attest to it? 
Um, Ricoeur quotes here uh, Claude Money um, to remind us that writing of that, which is what he does, um, demands a writer lover, not in love with oneself, not esteeming oneself. Writing of death is, uh, says what love demands, right? without love, memory cannot write the truth of life no longer, no longer as ours. Without fidelity, love cannot be hope beyond death. There can be no um, love beyond the grave. The writer who writes on death, dead, dying, has the gaze that uh, look, and here he quotes money, pure et fraternel, pure and fraternal. Um, actually, the words, nul ne peut décrire s'il n'a le cœur pur. One does not have a pure heart, one cannot write about lying. And um, pure here, which of course may strike us, uh, sounding very much like self-righteousness, you know, who has that? Has nothing to do, though, um, with self-righteousness. Pure means without imaginary projections, without objectification. Pure as lucid pursuit of ethical transference. The movement that, com that confronts me with the truth of the other, as a um, philosopher and psychoanalyst, uh, Levi Valenci, um, uh, wrote, purity is love. Perhaps the word would be innocence of love, the opposite of a prostituted friendship where one objectifies the other in so-called, so-hoped, but failed endearings. Ipsity, as the I can, of creative fidelity becomes, for Ricoeur, passion. Passion makes Ipsity ambiguous. To renounce, relative, you know, to renounce Ipsity, renouncing its being, its university, is to renounce its self-evidence. What is renouncing Ipsity then here? The image of renouncing Ipsity hints at the life of the passion of the I, the sacrifice of any ontological security, even in the mode of the I can. And what remains of the I to sacrifice his being, and I can. The fraternal gaze, the assurance called love, that the beloved is present beyond death. Love calls to passion. It is not enough to say that love calls me and I can respond and I can think of how to respond and to whom. Love calls to itself, ultimately. And he says um, uh, several times that love, in uh, also Amour et Justice, uh, Love and Justice, um, uh, that uh, love is the subject of ethics. That's why love calls. Uh, not just the object of ethics. In uh, no other mode than passion can the I answer the call. Modes other than the passion, kenosis, are modes in which fraternity is still threatened from an I that cannot give up its own pain selective memories, imagery of evil others, and so on. Evil that threatens fraternity um, is also within, of the order of the I can, in giving it up, all projection, however painful, which requires both a hermeneutics and an ethics of the face, um, of the face to face, is experienced as infinite call, a call stronger than death and pain. To remember, to commemorate, to depart in loving the other, are deeper still um, uh, than uh, are, are um, questions deeper than the I can sacrifices of any category and self assurance. It is hope which philosophy of language cannot really structure semantically, and which epistemology cannot really take uh, seriously if it works with truth functions. So, what sort of hermeneutics is the hermeneutics of love stronger than death? A therapeutical, ascetic hermeneutics of the imaginary of death. But the ascetic hermeneutics go, goes hand in hand with an ascetic ethics that um, prioritizes, by way of affected or felt sociality and fraternity, the face of the other. Um, I hope that in uh, these uh, reflections that are um, you know, demanding of more, so I have um, at least signaled to the um, connections between um, Ipsaity as an ambiguous um, uh, term and uh, um, kenosis, kenosis and uh, transference. Um, and I hope that I have shown to some extent that love does pervade all orders of living, the orders of, as I called it, the I am, the I can, the I cannot. I hope to have shown that uh, Love moves us 
um, as lives confronted with otherness. Uh, I hope to have shown that it's no longer being that is for the other in uh, uh, these sketches of Yvon Giscard Um that before the other as gift is the love from the place of the I cannot. Discipline, as I talked about it, the asceticism, Epimelea uh, to the self-care, is here Socratic in, uh, in these um, meditations of Ikeok on, uh, on dying. Um, Socratic, I mean, it signifies truth ironically. The truth that it is from the I cannot that one loves, that one gives, rather than is for the other. One gives from resources that one does not have, in other words. And this cannot, if I do not have, I do not have even a self-identity or I identity, yet this I give is love of uh, the other as uh, my uh, beloved. Thank you. So as soon as I sat down, I realized I was remiss in two ways. One, this is a um, joint lecture by the Philosophy Department Speaker Series and the Simon Silverman Phenomenology Center. Um, and two, uh, Dr. Christina Bucher uh, has been a scholar in residence at the Phenomenology Center for the last year and a half. Thank you. Um, I and so, forgot to um, mention it. I was so <laughs> eager to share with you my project. So, that and I was so eager to hear. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> Thank you so, for the graciousness um, so <laughs> which that's you give me. You know, so, um, uh, I think, as is customary, let's take a five-minute break, stretch our legs, and uh, we'll come back and have a Q&A.